Hello everyone, I apologize for the delay in this video, but scheduling this week has been a bit of a mess, so you're getting it now. Uh, a couple updates on the channel, future videos, um, there will be another WrestleMania MVP LVP up later this week, probably on Friday. On Saturday, I definitely want to do another one of my uh, Saturday Night's Main Event slash Clash of Champions streams. I'm really enjoying doing those, and I can't wait to do more. So, um, this one will probably be later in the day, uh, probably closer to like 8 p.m. or so, as opposed to early in the morning and into the early afternoon, like the, the first two were. And that's because I have something scheduled out um, earlier in the day, so that's probably going to keep me from doing it early in the morning. But, I do want to do another stream, it'll probably be happening Saturday night, but again, I will keep you posted and I will let you know. Uh, follow me on Twitter and you'll get all the updates. And on Sunday, we are getting WWE Fastlane, so I want to do a review of that. Uh, I've, I've been pretty good about getting the reviews up the night of the pay-per-view, so I'd like to keep that streak going. But, earlier this week, we also had the New Japan 46th Anniversary Show, so I want to watch that. I haven't watched it yet. And we have Ring of Honor's 16th Anniversary on Friday night, and I want to watch that as well. So, there, if everything goes according to plan... You're probably going to get a big review spectacular from me on Sunday night, right after Fastlane. Um, just three big shows all in one video and just knock them all out. So that should be fun, and I'm looking forward to at least watching uh, New Japan and Ring of Honor. can't say much about Fastlane because I haven't watched SmackDown in forever, so I have no idea what's going on there right now. All I know is that AJ vs. Nakamura is happening at Mania. That's literally all I know. But... Um, with all that said, I mentioned Ring of Honor earlier, and this video is going to be about Ring of Honor, this little promotion in the Northeast that is beloved by diehard wrestling fans and has been for a long time, pretty much ever since its inception in 2002, and it has been around and survived for 16 years, and it has done so by carving their own identity and blazing their own trail and just being the show that appeals to the diehard wrestling fan, and... There's something to respect about that. Um, they've they've prided themselves on being kind of the pure wrestling show and appealing to that super diehard, smarky type of wrestling fan. And in doing so, um, they've actually managed to survive in a business during a time when you know WCW had just gone under, or well, been sold to WWE. And ECW had just gone under, and it looked like wrestling was on a downturn, and then all of a sudden Ring of Honor comes up, and TNA shows up, and a few other promotions show up, and a lot of those promotions that were around, started up at around 2002, 2003 or so, are still around today. And that's pretty awesome, at least. Uh, you know, through all the highs and lows, it is nice that we have different options out there. And Ring of Honor um, has been fairly consistent all the way throughout. It's had its down points, too, but overall it's been... They deliver on what they promise, which is solid, high-quality wrestling action. Um, I'll admit I was never the most devout Ring of Honor fan because trying to keep up with the wrestling product through uh, buying DVDs uh, wasn't um, the most ideal situation for someone who was going through high school and college at the time. Uh, so there wasn't really uh, much for me. Uh, it was hard for me to keep up with it is basically what I'm saying and uh, especially you know just buying DVDs being the main way to keep up with this product um, I would try to watch the big ones that people would recommend to me and uh, whenever there was a really really good match that came out and people were like dude you need to check this out I would try and watch those but watching it on a regular basis was not something that was easy for me but I'd always heard about it and always read about it and I I've gone back and watched as much as I could um, and some shows are great. Some shows, I think, try too hard to be great. Where I've said it before, but if you try to make every single match amazing, then none of them are amazing and they all just look the same. Uh, it's like that old line from The Incredibles. If everybody's super, nobody is. And, uh, you know, sometimes Ring of Honor were victims of them being almost too good for their own good, if that makes any sense. But... Um, it can't be denied, uh, the identity that they carve for themselves, the rabid fan base that they produce that are still around to this day, um, the fact that they've survived this long is amazing on its own, and, and to their credit, they've evolved as a product. I think now that they're putting on shows that are still good and still give you the quality action that you expect from them, but also giving them something more 
consumable for the general wrestling fan or the casual wrestling fan. Something that would be a little easier to watch for, uh, you know, the more the the less devout wrestling fans, shall we say? And but uh, you know, if you look at the list of talents they've produced, I mean, good lord, look at the WWE roster. Kevin Owens, he started as Kevin Steen. Uh, Sami Zayn, he was El Generico. Um, somebody you may have heard of called Brian Danielson. He never really went on to do anything except main event WrestleMania uh, as Daniel Bryan. Um, you have Samoa Joe. AJ Styles came from there. Christopher Daniels came from there. Um, Loki came from there. Uh, so many guys and so many great talents. Austin Aries, Nigel McGuinness. Uh, God, Tyler Black, Seth Rollins. Um... Some of these guys went on to be some of the biggest stars in wrestling today, and the amount of great talents that they produced uh, cannot be understated, and I think Ring of Honor has left an influence on wrestling, and most of that has been a good influence. Um, I forgot to mention him, Cesaro, he was another one, Claudio Castagnoli, one of my favorites uh, to watch in Ring of Honor. So, um, yeah, Ring of Honor, they've definitely found their place in pro wrestling, and they've definitely left their mark, and continue to entertain me to this day, and I'm looking forward to watching their 16th anniversary show, and I'm definitely looking forward to uh, their WrestleMania weekend show, where we're getting Cody Rhodes versus Kenny Omega. That's going to be great. So, a lot of stuff to look forward to in the future, but they have a really great past as well, so today I'm going to list my top 10 favorite Ring of Honor matches of all time. Now, Keep in mind that this list is made from a guy who is not a walking encyclopedia of Ring of Honor. I've not watched every single Ring of Honor show. I have not watched um, religiously for all 16 years. I pretty much just stop and go and uh, watch it when I can. And that's pretty much my method of, of viewing it. And um, so if this list seems a little off to you, keep that in mind that there's there's probably amazing hidden gems from Ring of Honor that I'm not even aware of. That, Or there's probably great outstanding matches out there that I never got a chance to see and haven't had a chance to see. But they are doing their streaming service, The Honor Club, so who knows, in the future might be a good opportunity to start checking that stuff out. But uh, that's it with the introduction. Let's get started with the matches. Let's jump right into number 10. And I'm nice like B.I.G. is. Nice. I'm the greatest of all times. I'm going to say it just like Ali did. Say. The champ is here. Oh, shit. The champ is here. The champ is here. The evil genius. The champ is here. Come on. Come on. The champ is here. Okay, now this one might seem a little strange because this is not considered one of the great classic legendary Ring of Honor matches. And um, it didn't have a hot program either. It was pretty much just two baby faces being put into a contenders match. Let's put them together, see who wins, and the winner gets a title shot. And that's pretty much all there was to it. But, as I've said before, the live experience definitely makes a huge difference. And I was there at Super Card of Honor 7, live and in person, and I saw this match, and it was absolutely incredible. Great card all around. You had the American Wolves taking on Red Dragon. You had uh, us calling Matt Hardy a fat fuck. You had Jay Briscoe winning the ROH World title from Kevin Steen. A lot of great stuff on this show, but it was this match that really stood out to me as I thought both guys poured their heart and soul into this match, and I thought it was absolutely terrific, pretty much from start to finish. Uh, I thought it was great. Um, great work from both guys, and uh, both of them have done very well since then. El Elgin has remained uh, fairly... Solid Workers had several successful tours in Japan and continues to perform well to this day. And then you have Jay Leith, who's become kind of the gold standard in Ring of Honor and has been for the last few years. Uh, so both guys did very well in this match. It was a great showing for them, and uh, it was an amazing live experience to get to witness this match. Now, it's not my favorite Ring of Honor match of all time because it's in the number 10 spot, but it is my favorite Ring of Honor match that I have seen live. So that has to count for something. The champ is here! The champ is here! The champ is here! The evil genius! The champ is here! Come on! Come on. The champ is here! From there we go on to the ladder war. Ring of Honor's version of the ladder match. Uh, I believe they've done six ladder wars to date. And I remember when this first one happened. Uh, it got a lot of hype and a lot of praise uh, online in the reviews and everything when it first happened. Um, it involved the Briscoe Brothers taking on El Generico and Kevin Steen for the Ring of Honor World Tag Team titles, and 
They went all friggin' out in this thing. It was crazy. Um, a bit spot festy. It was, uh, but for as far as like a ladder spot fest goes, I thought it was a very entertaining one and very good. Especially when you felt like both teams were legitimately trying to kill each other, and uh, they really wanted those tag titles, man. Uh, yeah, the event, Man Up, two thousand seven. Uh, they were given the main event spot, which that's always cool to see uh, a tag title match get the main event spot. And they absolutely tore it down. Just amazing, uh, nasty at times, some of the spots they did to each other. Um, but overall, an amazing display, great showcase, and uh, just a perfect example of four talents just trying to make a name for themselves by going all out, balls to the walls, the type of thing that Ring of Honor was known for at the time, and still known for to a degree today. And um, one thing I also like about Ring of Honor is that they space these matches out. They don't do the ladder war on an annual basis. They just kind of save it for when they need it and I think that makes it more special when you do things like that and Ring of Honor is typically pretty good about saving their gimmick matches for when they're more special so uh, yeah I really enjoyed this match I think it's great and uh, started a nice string of matches for Ring of Honor because they would do five more ladder wars after this one the champ is here oh, shit. the champ is here the champ is here the evil genius the champ is here come on, come on. One of the earliest great feuds that came in Ring of Honor uh, was between CM Punk and Raven in 2003. Basically, um, a clash of personalities. You have CM Punk, who is straight edge, and doesn't do drugs, doesn't drink, and then you have Raven, who's a bit more checkered in his past, and Punk looked down on Raven for that. And um, their feud built up to this point. They had this uh, no disqualifications dog collar match, and the end result was something that it was very unique in wrestling because it captured a bunch of different things. Um, it had a classic old school feel to it because you have a, a, a baby face in Raven, you have a heel in CM Punk, and now the, the heel and the face are being chained together and the heel can't get away and the face can get his hands on him and do whatever he wants to him. Um, you have the more like ECW style of match with some of the hardcore elements and the wild brawling through the crowd and that type of stuff. and. Um, and you had kind of the new age, or at the time, kind of the, um, how do I want to put this? Uh, some of the new age material that Ring of Honor would be known for and kind of that, that forward step of evolution. So it was kind of a mix of everything. Um, you know, Punk brought some of the new stuff. Raven brought a lot of the stuff that felt familiar. The storyline was great, and it all built to this really, really well done match that was hardcore. It was great. Um... There were run-ins from Cole Cabana helping Punk and Tommy Dreamer, who would help Raven. Um, all really good stuff. Ultimately, CM Punk would get the win, but then post-match, he would try to humiliate Raven further, which brought out Tommy Dreamer, who helped uh, defend Raven. And the end result was CM Punk being handcuffed to the ring ropes, while Raven, uh, and by the way, Punk was covered in blood at this point, and Raven, to taunt him, would pour beer all over him and down his throat as like a final fuck you uh, to pretty much close out the feud. The heel gets the win, but the baby face gets to stand tall at the end. Um, very well executed, wonderfully told story. I thought CM Punk was terrific in this. Uh, such an asshole. <laughs> the entire match, and especially the ending. It was actually really satisfying to watch him get humiliated right after he tried to humiliate Raven. So, again, it had that old school element to it. Classic heel versus face stuff. And... I think it's an excellent match. It's one of uh, one of the earliest classics in Ring of Honor, and I think it's definitely worth checking out. The champ is here! Oh, shit. The champ is here! The champ is here! The evil genius! The champ is here! Come on! Come on. The champ is here! Now let's go from the very first Death Before Dishonor to the eighth Death Before Dishonor uh, a few years later. In the main event, you had ROH World Champion Tyler Black defending the gold against Davey Richards. Now, um, Tyler Black, as I mentioned earlier, you may know as Seth Rollins, current WWE uh, big-time star, main eventer, uh, former WWE champion. Um, and when you watch a match like this, and Tyler, still young in his career, um, you see the main event potential in a guy like this. And uh, Davey Richards uh, also helped to bring out the best of him. Now, it's also funny because when you watch this match, the crowd was totally ready for Davey to win the belt. And the fans had kind of turned on Tyler at this point. He'd kind of become the John Cena of 
ROH at this point where like uh, many of the fans were just sick of seeing him with the belt and uh, they wanted Davey to get it. And that made for a fun atmosphere in this match, if nothing else, because you had this strong baby face that people really, really wanted to win in, in Davey. And I thought the match was hard-hitting, stiff as hell at times. Some of the things they did to each other was insane. And, I mean, like, even, you know, somewhat simple stuff like striking looked like they were coming at you a little harder than usual. I mean, Davey Richards was cut from the same cloth as, like, those... Uh, those guys like Chris Benoit and Eddie Guerrero and those type of guys where they they make the stuff they do look really good. And I thought these two had a very well-wrestled, uh, very exciting, awesome main event uh, to close out this show. Uh, the fans were left disappointed by the time it was over because Tyler retained the title, but and Tyler retained it in a fashion where he pretty much just beat Davey down and beat him... Um, you know, in the last couple of minutes, pretty much dominated and just beat him down, uh, establishing himself as the true dominant champion. But uh, I thought the match was absolutely incredible, great main event, and a great early masterpiece from someone who would become a big star in the WWE. So it's definitely worth checking out. The champ is here! Oh, shit. The champ is here! The champ is here! The evil genius! The champ is here! Come on! Come on. It's very appropriate for this match that Final Battle is considered to be the biggest show of Ring of Honor's calendar year because the buildup that this feud had was completely worthy of a WrestleMania or a Starcade or some big show like that. This is a storyline that deserved a long buildup and then to be paid off in a huge way at the biggest event of the year. And that feud was El Generico versus Kevin Steen. Um, I would say arguably the greatest feud in Ring of Honor history. Um, I, I mean, I liked everything about it from the Friends Become Enemies angle to Steen taking El Generico's mask to the, uh, Steen's partnership with Carino to uh, the double chain match where Carino and Steen took on um, Cabana and Generico uh, to uh, Steen's increasing intensity and insanity in trying to drive El Generico away. And it was ultimately settled that this feud needed to be decided in a unsanctioned fight without honor. And again, fight without honor, it's one of those things that Ring of Honor doesn't use too often, so when they do, it actually carries weight and actually means something. And they gave them the main event spot of Final Battle and just pretty much let them go all out. Um, Generico put his mask on the line and uh, Kevin Steen put, on his, put up his Ring of Honor career. Um, he would ultimately lose this match and it didn't really stick, but still, it was, it was career versus mask. Uh, battle between former friends and this match was a violent spectacle um, Steen was great in this uh, absolutely just a perfect brutish heel all the way through and that allowed uh, Generico to be the babyface the underdog uh, you know back when Sami Zayn was one of the best underdog babyfaces in wrestling and uh, yeah, I just thought they absolutely killed it. I thought all the references to past events in the storyline, the ending was really well done. I thought it was just an excellently, excellently told story with a great payoff between two young talents that could pull it off. And I thought it was great. I loved it. It's one of my favorite matches in Ring of Honor history and uh, just a stellar main event all around. The champ is here! Oh, shit. The champ is here! The champ is here! Genius. The champ is here! Come on! Come on. The champ is here! Next up we have Samoa Joe taking on uh, former All Japan star and Pro Wrestling Noah star Kenta Kobashi in a somewhat of a cross-promotional match that happened in 2005. And this match can best be described as two big brutes beating the shit out of each other. So if you like watching two big brutes beat the shit out of each other, this is the match for you. And... I really enjoyed it. I really like watching it. I've watched it twice, and I thought the crowd reaction was insane. I thought the crowd was just totally excited and just um, reacting to every little thing that they did. I thought um, everything they did to each other, the, the two wrestlers, looked like it hurt, <laughs> and uh, it made for fun viewing. It was just a really fun battle between two big hosses beating the crap out of each other, and who doesn't like that? Um... That's really all there is to say about this. Uh, Kabashi would get the win, uh, which it wasn't common to see Samoa Joe lose in Ring of Honor, but it was still an excellent match, very good stuff, and one of the more well-known classics in Ring of Honor history and uh, completely worthy of its reputation. The champ is here! Oh, shit. The 
champ is here! The champ is here! The evil genius! The champ is here! Come on! Come on. The champ is here! Yes, yes, I am cheating here. Slots 2, 3, and 4 are gonna go to the Samoa Joe and CM Punk trilogy of matches. Probably the most famous matches in Ring of Honor history and really the matches that gave them their identity. Um, I've already talked about these matches a bit when I did my top 10 trilogies video, so I'm going to keep it somewhat short. But what I will say is that I rewatched all three of these matches in preparing for this video. And on the rewatch, what I found to be most uh, interesting was that I still think the first one is the best. I think... Um, the fans weren't expecting it to go an hour, so it had that extra level of excitement to it. I thought the work that they did was excellent. Um, the injury, like, uh, I love the spot where, after having his leg worked on for so much of the match, uh, Punk finally hits the Pepsi plunge, but then can't capitalize because he came down on his knees and hurt his legs, uh, which had been worked over the entire match. I love that stuff. I love it when I love it when the injuries in matches actually play a role in how the story plays out. Um, that always works for me. Uh, but the most interesting thing is that the second match is the one that got the perfect five stars from Meltzer and the Wrestling Observer. I think it's my least favorite of the three. <laughs> so it shows that I'm not always on the same wa uh, wavelength as uh, old Dave there. But uh, giving the third one another watch, I think uh, I think that one kind of instantly got written off because it was by far the shortest. It o only went a half an hour. And uh, I think because of that, it automatically got written off as, as the weakest one. Uh, sort of like what happened to Okada and Omega 3 last year, where everyone loved it, but it's considered less legendary than the other two, because it was obviously the shortest one. But um, I thought the story they told in the third one was so good that I think that elevated it uh, considerably. Namely, Samoa Joe has finally had it up to here with punk shit, and feels like... I, no, I shouldn't be struggling with this guy. I am the dominant motherfucker who runs this joint. I should be destroying him. And he pretty much beat CM Punk into oblivion by the time the match was over and took that win come hell or high water, uh, effectively ending their feud in their series of matches. And uh, just, uh, but all three matches are very good. I think all three matches are excellent. And like I said, these are the matches that really gave Ring of Honor their identity. That feud, that series. Uh, the CM Punk Samoa Joe trilogy, those are the matches. When I think Ring of Honor, those are the first matches that come to mind. There is as much a part of that, uh, the identity to Ring of Honor as Hogan Andre is to WWF. Or, you know, uh, like the Unbreakable Triple Threat is to TNA. It's just, it, it's more than just really great matches. Those are matches that really defined a promotion and defined what they were all about. And for that, I give them all the credit in the world. The champ is here! Oh, shit. The champ is here! The champ is here! The evil genius! The champ is here! Come on! Come on. The champ is here! We have my favorite match in Ring of Honor history. Brian Danielson, the ROH World Heavyweight Champion, taking on Nigel McGuinness, the ROH Pure Champion, in a unification match in England. And, oh my god, do I love this match. Um, it had a big match feel. I love the situation, unifying the titles. Two champions that were booked very well and considered major stars in the promotion. Both pure athletic specimens that could get on the mat and really wrestle and hard hit with each other. And uh, the end result was a very exciting match from bell to bell. Now, I will say that this match was wrestled under pure title rules. And I will take this little sidebar here. To talk about the Ring of Honor pure title, which a lot of Ring of a lot of Ring of Honor fans I've talked to did not like the pure title. <coughs> this was I'm pretty sure this was the last time that the uh, the pure title rules came into effect because the title was effectively uh, wiped away after this. Now, for those of you who did not like the pure title, may I ask why? Because the only answers I've ever gotten were the matches were too hard to follow. Now, very similar to the Bound for Glory series, which I really liked. Uh, and I thought it was one of the best things TNA ever did. And they needed to nurture it and do more with it and work to improve it. Instead, they kind of just did away with it. But a lot of fans said that was too confusing. To which my response was, well, can you not add? You can't add numbers? Is that too hard? Um, you can't keep track of like basic you know, five plus five or that type of shit. Cause I'm pretty sure a first grader can do that. 
And it was kind of a similar situation here where the rule structure of a pure title match uh, involves certain rules. I'm trying to remember them all. I believe it was uh, both wrestlers get um, three rope breaks and only three rope breaks. So if you're in the ropes after using up your three rope breaks, you don't get a break and you can tap out. Uh, 20 count outside the ring. Um, no punches to the face, which I like that rule <laughs> because that's the way it should be. Open hand or uh, close fist punches shouldn't be allowed in pro wrestling because they don't make sense. Uh, no, they should. So I like that rule a lot. And if close fist punches are thrown, the first one gets a warning. Second one, you lose a rope break. And if you're out of rope breaks, you get disqualified. Like, okay, understand that. And I believe there was one other rule. Oh, the title could change hands on count out or disqualification. Now, are those rules really that hard to follow? I mean, I don't know. Like, the biggest thing to keep track of are the rope breaks. And it's like, what, you can't count? You can't count down from three? I keep track of things in threes all the time. They're called timeouts in football. My God, man. It's like, how, how hard is this? I, I don't know. I never thought it was that complicated. I never thought it was that hard. To me, it was like, all right, they've got this new title. They wrestle under different rules. It's well-defined. Uh, they stick to those rules, and it's fine. Um, and that's one of the things that TNA's X Division was missing is that there was really no definition of what the X Division was. They just always said, not about weight limits, we're about no limits. And I'm like, well, what the fuck does that mean? So it's basically a cruiserweight division where fat fucks can be a cruiserweight champion. That's basically what it is. But there was no, like, separate rule structure or weight limit or anything that set the X Division apart from everything else. So it just felt like a random, well, what the fuck, we can do whatever we want. And that's how you wind up with Abyss as X Division champion. But... Um, you know, uh, <laughs> basic point, I like the pure title, and I thought that this match was great, and the pure title rules did not hinder it at all whatsoever. Um, I thought both guys were at their peak, at least in Ring of Honor. Daniel Bryan would obviously go on to bigger and better things in WWE. Nigel's career was unfortunately cut short, um, which is really a shame, because he had a lot of potential. It was really a, a lot of fun to watch, and... He was the de facto babyface in this match, mainly because of where the match was uh, was set. And um, I thought that this was an excellent, well-wrestled match with a big fight feel. And um, I even loved the finish where Daniel pretty much just pummeled Nigel McGuinness down until the referee called for the bell and had to stop it. Um, had a very MMA-style type of finish to it, so... Uh, yeah, two very talented wrestlers in a great situation with a uh, well-booked um, scenario of two titles being on the line and uh, both of them getting unified. And the end result was just pure wrestling magic, just great stuff. And again, the type of stuff that Ring of Honor was known for. So those are my top ten favorite Ring of Honor matches of all time. Now, as I've said before, I have not seen it come anywhere close to seeing all the great matches in Ring of Honor's history. So if you have any recommendations for me, Please list them down below in the comments section. I would love to go back and watch some of that old stuff that I had never seen before. So, uh, yeah, I will gladly take any recommendations for great Ring of Honor matches because I'm always on the lookout for new wrestling. And, hey, if I'm going to nostalgia, you know, mark out for uh, Saturday Night Night's main event and Clash of Champions, I think I can do that for, with, you know, some stuff I've never watched before. It's like, oh, it would be cool to go back and watch some of those old Ring of Honor things I never watched before. Mm -hmm. That would be nice. Um, it is weird for me to call anything from Ring, Ring of Honor old, but they've been around for almost uh, over a decade and a half now, so uh, they're doing something right, clearly. But that is all I have for this video. Like I said, follow me on Twitter. Um, be sure to like and subscribe and hit the little bell uh, icon so you get notifications on my new videos. I've got a lot of videos uh, planned for you over the next few days, but for right now, I'm done here, and that is it. So see you later, everybody.